I don't have any juice. I don't have any salacious details for you. If you came here to get that, you came to the wrong place. You might as well switch off this video and go to a different video. But we are going to talk about the fall of Stephen J. Lawson that became known to the world just last night in a tragic post from his church, Trinity, uh, Trinity Bible Church in Dallas, made a statement indicating that Stephen Lawson had uh, acknowledged some kind of an appropriate affair relationship with a woman and had been terminated from his position. I'm not here to rejoice in that. I'm not here to gloat in that. I realize that there are quite a number of people that would do that. Uh, there are people that would make a career of that. There are blogs devoted to exposing other people's sin. And that's never been the focus of this channel. It's never been a desire of mine to sort of rejoice in that kind of thing. So I have got no, like I said, no juicy or salacious details for you. But we do want to talk about this because this is, of course, tragic for the sake of Christ's church. And not only that, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people that are hurt by this. Not only the principles, namely those persons that are directly involved with the situation itself. Remember, these are real human beings, not internet fictional characters that have been created but rather real human beings. There's a tragedy there, but then there's a tragedy every single time that Christ's church is denigrated or besmirched by the wicked acts of men, especially men who pretend to be righteous and perhaps are to some extent. Well, what's up, everybody? My name is Matthew. I'm one of the pastors here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. Uh, thank you for checking into my channel today. Um, not going to say much other than we're going to get right into some of the details of the story. So let's first of all go to the statement itself from Trinity Bible Church. It says this, and I'm just going to read this. The elders at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas regretfully announced that effective immediately Stephen J. Lawson has been removed indefinitely from all ministry activities at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. Several days ago, the elders at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas were informed by Steve Lawson of an inappropriate relationship that he has had with a woman. The elders have met with Steve and will continue to come alongside him and pray for him with the ultimate goal of his personal repentance. Steve will no longer be compensated by Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. In light of this, may we remind, may we be reminded that we are all sinners, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Christ remains the head of his church, which is bigger than any fallen man. In fact, Christ Jesus will continue to lead his church, including Trinity Bible Church here in Dallas, just like he has from the start of the work on January 5, 2018. Since that time, the elders have focused on the primacy of biblical exposition knit together by various men filling the pulpit each week. The Lord was building Trinity Bible Church of Dallas well before Steve became our lead preacher. He will continue to build his church long after Steve Lawson or any other man for that matter. We would ask for your prayers for the elders, for our body, and for Steve and for his family. Let us always be mindful of the words of 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. That is a pretty well-crafted statement, in my opinion. Uh, more to that same point, let's look at Ligonier. Of course, you know that Ligonier um, was a supporting ministry of Stephen Lawson's preaching for some time. He was one of the teaching fellows at Ligonier. After the death of R.C. Sproul, of course, no one man could fill those particular set of shoes, and so they d determined to go to a bevy, a team, a starting lineup, as it were, uh, introducing other conference speakers from, from time to time, but primarily fe featuring the uh, fellowship teaching ministers. And we notice here that Stephen Lawson has been removed from the site. Last night, it was even more glaringly obvious. They had just a big hole over here on the side of the page. At least they've a center set the uh, teaching fellows now. It looked more obvious last night. But that notwithstanding, um, the reason we want to talk about this today is because this is, of course, the kind of sin that brings a tarnishing to the name of Christ. And for this, we do not gloat or rejoice. Brothers, um, I want to address some of you who are in ministry today. I know there are a lot of pastors and elders and deacons that watch this channel. You should be very careful lest you put your name on the bulletin of your church, brothers. And what I mean by that is... Any one of us who takes up an official office within Christ Church, we are risking, in some sense, embarrassing the name of Christ himself. Now, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to preach. Somebody has to teach. Somebody has to lead Sunday school. Somebody has to take up the office of eldership. Eldership is, of course, commissioned in the New Testament. 
as is the work of the preaching pastor or the teaching elder. But brothers, we must be extremely careful when we presume to fill those roles because we are risking the public defamation of the name of Christ. And of course, this is exactly why these moments are so painful for the church. It's not because we love the details. Some of you may, and I think that's a perverse desire on your part to know the salacious details of other people's tawdry affairs. But the reason we're concerned is because we're concerned for the sake of the church, right? We love the church, and we love the church because we love Christ. And while somebody must necessarily step up and preach, every time somebody does, they're risking the tarnishing of the name of Christ because we risk tarnishing the name of the church. And one of the things that we have to understand, brothers, is that the world, the unbelieving world, will always rejoice in these kind of falling moments, whereas the church is embittered and often disenfranchised and often confused. It often sets people into modes of meandering and wandering in their faith. But the, the, the unbelieving world, rather, loves to rejoice in these moments because this is where they put their finger in the chest of the church and they say, see, you guys have been hypocrites all along. Uh, you preached a uh, gospel of repentance and faith and holiness and holy lifestyle and a forsaking of sexual sin and perversions. And here you are with some of your most well-known leaders falling into it again and again and again and time after time after time. And every single time that the unbelieving world is given the opportunity um, to point that finger in our chest, the church is weakened and Christ's name is dishonored and believers are sometimes confused and even scattered. Let me tell you a personal story. Um, my second church that I served in as a youth pastor, I'm not going to name the church or the details because that's not the point. But our senior pastor during that time, this is the early 2000s, had an affair with one of the um, one of the persons in the office, and that leader, I won't name him today, left in the middle of the night and left all of his stuff and took his personal effects out of the office, and he was just gone. And it happened to be a Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, no word. Sunday morning, people came to church. There's no preacher. Look in his office. His stuff is gone. Uh, left the few things that belonged to the church and took his things, and that was it. It never came back. And uh, here we are, 2024. It's been almost 20 years, and that church has not regained the vibrancy that it had during that man's preaching ministry. And from the gospel that he preached, it was a vibrant and growing church. And that that moral misgiving, that error, that um, that sin, that transgression, that iniquity hurt the church so bad that it's taken um, almost two decades to recover, and, and the Lord only knows if it ever will recover. These things hurt the church incredibly bad. And not only that, but in the case of, of Stephen Lawson, um, similar to Liam Gallagher in 10th Presbyterian, just recently over on the other side of Pennsylvania, you have two men who ostensibly have led incredible pastoral ministry careers. I mean, stellar. We're talking about excellent preaching. We're talking about excellent writings. We're talking about excellent conference ministry. It was sad. And I'm grieving a little, I'm grieving a little bit here because looking on Twitter and Facebook, this story is absolutely everywhere. So many people posting pictures of themselves with Stephen Lawson talking about how they admired him, they knew him, he was kind, he was gracious, his message changed their lives, his preaching was very helpful for them at some point in their lives. I personally benefited very greatly, very early on, from his book, The Unwavering Resolve of Jonathan Edwards. He did these amazing little series of tiny booklets in which he took a man from church history thoroughly researched him and put him in context of, of scripture and his doctrines, high view of the sovereignty of God, etc. Man, this book, this book was one of the books that helped get me excited about Jonathan Edwards as I was doing my dissertation study. So I could say, yeah, I've never met Steve Lawson, but he impacted my life. Um, his book series, Pillars of the Faith, extraordinarily helpful work seeing the five solas and the tulip doctrines being preached throughout church history. Man, that book opened my eyes to a lot of 
wonderful and glorious truths in church history. And yet, here the saddest thing is that he stumbles at the finish line. I mean, how old is how old is Stephen Lawson? I don't know. I didn't Google it. Late sixties, early seventies. Am I wrong? And he's preached his last sermon at this point. Like, what are you going to do? Same thing with Liam Gallagher from Tenth, stumbling at the finish line. I mean, literally falling down at the very end. It is just so tragic. Have you ever seen like in the Olympics? Um, a, a race and track, uh, track and field when the athletes are coming to the finish line and maybe one of the athletes slows up just enough to throw their hands in the air in mid-celebration when they look to their side and they see somebody else bolting past them and they lose the medal, right? Or even worse than that, um, coming towards the finish line, tripping over their own two feet and falling flat at the line. That's what happened here. That's what happened here. There's not going to be a chance for a, a big comeback, if there even should be. Uh, same thing with Gallagher. But we see um, these men who are otherwise respectable, honorable men, outstanding careers. Would have been better if he died, honestly, because then at least um, his career would be upstanding and his work would be honored. But What's going to happen to his legacy, his preaching, his conference videos, his books, his writings, his sermons, the people that followed him? Well, certainly there's eternal fruit. And, and um, a lot of people's lives were legitimately bettered by the preaching ministry of these men. But to stumble at the line is so lamentable. And so what do we learn about this, especially as the Reformed community? How about this? We in the Reformed Church, Reformed churches, now they weren't Presbyterian, they were Baptists, but they were Reformed in doctrine, right? Granted. We are some of the worst at making idols out of men. That is true. Probably the only, okay. <laughs> well, the Roman Catholics can do their thing with that too, can't they? They certainly can with their ranks and their titles and their hierarchies and their special hats and their special outfit, outfits and bow down and kiss this ring. Got it. The mega churches and the Pentecostal churches, they have made their fair share of um, American idols, let's say, haven't they? But the reformed churches, we're bad at this, guys and ladies. We're bad at this. We make idols of men. We do. And for anybody who understands reformed theology, one of the things that you know is that we adhere to the second commandment, right? The second commandment, the regulative principle. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol of anything in the heavens above and the earth below or the seas below that. We do not make idols. We don't do images. We don't do statues. We don't do paintings of Christ. We don't do statues of the saints. We reform people. We are the 2CV people. We know the second commandment. And what do we do? Time and time again, we make idols out of men. This is one of the Achilles heels of Reformed theology. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but we do this. And uh, that's what sets us up from these catastrophic debacles, which hurt so many people. So what can we say positively? What can we say positively about this? I'm going to try to frame this up positively. Um, how about this? Well, we need to pray for the people involved because they're real people. Stephen Lawson is not a fictional character that was created on the internet. Uh, he is not a talking head at a, at a Ligonier conference or a national conference or master seminary or One Passion Ministries or Trinity Bible of Dallas. He's a real human being. And I am guessing right now that his life is absolutely being crushed under the weight of tremendous guilt and shame. Same thing with his wife. Same thing with his family his children, grandchildren, the woman with whom he committed the affair. Lives are absolutely being wrecked today and yesterday and will we'll continue to be wrecked for the next weeks and months and possibly years. These are real human beings. And so what can we do? We can offer real prayers for the sake of those who are hurting the most. Prayers of restoration, prayers of faith, prayers of renewal, prayers of helping, prayers of hope, prayers of healing. That's 
the obligation that true Christians owe to this situation. Not gloating, not dunking. I've seen people do that already online. I've seen people dunking on Calvinists. I've seen people dunking on Baptists. I've seen people dunking on Ligonier. There's no dunking in a moment like this. There's only only grieving and prayer for healing. Is there a silver lining? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe there's a silver lining. Let me let me go back to to one thing, um, if I if I can do that. I want to go back to the statement here on the Trinity site. The one thing that may be helpful is this. They were informed by Stephen Lawson of an inappropriate relationship that he had with a woman. Okay, so, so that's helpful. Why is that helpful? Because, because he admitted it. Uh, and so many men don't. So many men, ordained, not ordained, pastors, not pastors, Christians, not Christians, their consciences aren't, aren't pricked by sin, and, and Lawson's was, and he came forward with this. He did what my pastor did not do. My pastor, he hid it, obfuscated, fled, he did everything to refuse to admit what happened, left, moved away. That's what most men do. At least Steve Lawson had a... a as far as I understand the situation, a moment of courage of conscience in which he came forward, knowing what this would do, knowing what this would do to his relationship, knowing what this would do to his marriage, knowing what this would do to the church. But if the statement is correct, and I take it to be correct, he is the one who forwarded this information to the elders. Why did he do that? I don't know. I'm going to assume charitably that that was the Holy Spirit working in his life. And he realized that honoring Christ would be the highest thing he could do here. And so he turned himself into the elders. Maybe that's not true. Maybe there was discovery made. Maybe facts came forward. Maybe his wife saw the text messages or the pictures or who knows what. I have no idea. I'm not even suggesting that I know. Maybe he was pressed into a corner and had to admit. Again, who knows? I don't know. But at least we can say, silver lining, he is the one who came forward and told the elders about this. Now, what about Ligonier? Well, Ligonier is going to be rocked. And Ligonier is an outstanding ministry that I think most of us in the Reformed world, we deeply respect Ligonier. We're thankful for them. We're thankful for RC. We're thankful for other relationships with great teaching men that they've had in the past. John MacArthur and others, a lot of other guys that are respectable and been very helpful to the church. But Ligonier is going to hurt about this. And um, one thing that I wish could have happened is that Ligonier simply dropped him from the website rather than making some kind of a statement to explain. Now, maybe they're going to do that because they don't have all the facts. Granted, we're in the first 24 hours here. First 24 hours is what we've got. But I think that it's always better to say something rather than to just vanish somebody from the website. That, that would be helpful. So we'll look forward to see how Ligonier responds to this and who they could possibly choose to fill the roles of a person like Steve Lawson. Who knows? I don't know. It's going to be tough. But brothers and sisters watching this video, let me tell you, um, there are two things that will absolutely wreck a man's life and will wreck a church. There's probably more, but sex and money, sex and money, those are the things that absolutely scandalize a church. If, if it had come out that um, Stephen Lawson had a different sin like gambling, let's say, just arbitrarily pick that one, or speeding tickets, he's got like 10 speeding tickets, okay, you could weather that storm, ostensibly. You probably could. Uh, maybe you'd go on leave. Maybe there'd be a period of probation. I don't know. I don't know how discipline would happen at an independent Calvinistic church. I know how it would happen in a Presbyterian system for the most part. But I'll tell you, sex and money. Man, those two things will wreck, wreck a church. And pastors and ministers and deacons and elders, you would better be 
guarding your heart with the help of the Holy Spirit in these two particular areas because these are the two issues that the world, again, the unbelieving world, they will throw a dart at your face if you sin and scandalize the church in these two particular areas. And brothers, my goodness, I feel like I say this every single time things like this happen. You're going to get caught. You are. You're not going to be the one. How many men, how many husbands, how many pastors, how many men in church office have thought to themselves, I'm wiser than to get caught. I can press the envelope. I can get away with it. Other men have been exposed. Other men have failed. But I'm too smart for this. I'm going to have my cake and I'm going to eat it too. And I'm going to cover up all of the evidence. I'm going to delete the text. I'm going to protect my device. I'm going to password code my phone, whatever you think you're going to do to prevent your wife or your staff or your elders or your friends from finding out what you're doing. How many men have thought to themselves, I'm smarter than everyone else. I'm going to get away with it. But you're not going to get away with it. Here's why you're not going to get away with it. Two reasons. One, there's cameras everywhere in this world. (laughs) You can hardly get away with anything. Not that you'd want to as a believer, but if you did, how? Like the video evidence is everywhere. Smartphones are all over the place. Ring doorbells are everywhere. Every building has security cameras. There's no way that you could cover this kind of sin in your life. It's impossible. You can't do it. Uh, Maybe you're going to remember to delete every image that's sent to your phone and then you will forget you will forget one time and you will find that you are not more clever than everybody else that in fact um, you are just as much a fool as all the others who have fallen before you and you too will have your sin exposed the other reason is that even if you do get away with it everything is seen by the all-searching eyes of almighty god he knows he knows the lord knows There is no hidden place in the heart where you can conceal this kind of sin from the Lord. It always is found out, if not by the eyes of mortal men, at least by the all-seeing eyes of Almighty God. There is no getting away with this kind of sin. It is impossible. And the thing about sin that's so damnable is it always costs you more than you're willing to pay. It always hurts you more than you're willing to be hurt. And it's always far more damaging to the church and your relationships than you're willing to risk in the first place. You thought you'd get away with it. You are an absolute fool. No question about that. But as to silver linings and how we should wrap this rather meandering video up, brothers and sisters, Christ never fails. He is the one who is perfect in every possible way. Yes, the scriptures warn us again and again in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, about false teachers, false prophets. False not only in the sense of that their message may be wrong, but false in the sense that their moral lives are misleading to us. There's two kinds of false teachers, right? Those who teach heresy and those whose lives are hypocrisy. But Christ is faithful and his church is indefatigable, His church is um, going to gain the victory. His church cannot be stopped. Christ's church cannot be squelched. Um, It does at times hurt and smart from the sins that it experiences both internally and externally. The church suffers from persecution uh, externally and heresy internally at times. But the church, the capital C Church of Christ, will not fail. It cannot fail. And the reason that it cannot fail is because Christ himself cannot fail. Thank you for checking into this video. Love you lots.